Hey everybody, it's Kira here from Toronto. Today I have a very special guest, an unusual guest. This is Alan Slater. He is an independent cross-cultural trainer and coach. What it means is that he teaches executives and skilled workers to understand each other and other employees better, especially when they come from different cultures or their offices are situated in different parts of the world. What it gives organizations is increased productivity and reduction of conflicts. An interesting convo is expecting us. Hey, Alan. How Hi, are you? I'm good. How are you? I am good. You are talking to me from Israel. Yes. Yes. I am I'm the proud you. representative as well. <laughs> So to break the ice, let me ask you about your favorite fact about two cultures differences. Choose two cultures and how they're different. Um, I think I'm going to have to choose the concept of personal space between uh, Scandinavian cultures and South American cultures. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we, we think when we say personal space, we think that it's going to be the same everywhere, but actually it's extremely different. And when you say personal space in Scandinavia, you mean people are gonna be standing farther apart and they're gonna be feeling uncomfortable when you know, they approach each other a little bit too closely. And then in South America, you know, the first time I was in Argentina, I was kissed left and right by women and men that I don't know, that I've never met. And it was, it was a pretty unique experience. It was cozy for sure. For sure. I, I'm actually, apart from cultural differences, um, I have to say that I, um, I feel comfortable with less personal space. So for me, the visit to Argentina was quite okay but I'm pretty sure that there are a lot of people who would get there and who would feel a little bit uncomfortable. For sure. And I've also heard in the very beginning stages of the pandemic that Japanese levels of uh, pandemia were lower because people don't actually hug each other and they don't shake hands, but they welcome uh, themselves, each other at a distance. Yeah, I, I, I haven't heard that, but it makes, it makes a lot of sense. Cultures that don't touch each other and where personal space um, is, is greater between people, I'm assuming that the pandemic would have less of an impact. Yeah. Okie dokie, let's go and talk about yourself because what you do is very unique, not only in Israel, but I bet uh, in wider uh, world. So can you tell me please, first, how you've got there? And then we'll discuss what you enjoy the most. Well, um, as for how I got there, I think I'm going to have to blame my parents. <laughs> I think they are the guilty ones. And instead of going to a psychologist, I'm sharing this with you now. <laughs> uh, they actually took um, the family when I was nine years old. They took us to live in the U.S. for a couple of years. And uh, I think this was my first cultural experience. This was at a time when there was no Skype or cellular phones or internet. So moving there was a very, very big deal. And I needed to adjust to a new culture. Um, and at the end, uh, at the end of our stay there, I, I don't think I wanted to come back even oh, wow. to Israel and I needed to adjust again. So I think that from that point onwards, the topic of cultural differences, I think it interested me. Mm -hmm. And then I went to school and I studied social and organizational psychology at Columbia University in New York. And from that moment on, I understood that what I wanted to do was to bridge the cultural gap between people. Oh, that's awesome. That's great also that you knew what you want to do from the get-go. That's just amazing. <laughs> and what is that exactly what you do? And what are the main benefits companies or individuals you help are getting from your services? 
Well, I'm hoping that companies and individuals get benefits from, um, I guess, in three areas. Um, I would say awareness, knowledge, and skills. So first of all, you know, sometimes we're so um, immersed in our own culture that um, we don't really have a sense that our behaviors can be relative. You know, we, we behave a certain way. We think it's the only way to behave and it's almost unnatural to us uh, that people could behave differently in order to get the same results, right? Mm -hmm. um, there were a couple of um, writers on the topic of culture that wrote a book about it. I'm gonna remember their names in a bit. And uh, they wrote a book called Fish Can't See Water. And I think that's such a nice metaphor for cultural differences, right? Because we all swim in the water of mm -hmm. our own culture and we can't see that it's our own water, right? And only when we're taken somewhere else or on land maybe, then we start feeling a little bit of the distress and understanding that we're not in our normal environment. So that's the awareness part. The knowledge part is to tell people that it's actually quite a research topic. And there's a lot of research, for example, in management that's done on cultural differences. And you can actually quantify these differences and show where different cultures fall along several cultural dimensions. And the last thing is really skills. I try to give the people I work with the skills to become more effective in a global environment. Can you give me a few example, examples for the companies or CEOs who come to you? How exactly you can help and how you actually can measure that because you did mention it's measurable. Right. So um, I have to say that the measurement part, um, wait, let's, let's begin with how I can help, right? Yep. So when I, um, when I get approached by a certain organization, typically the internal focal point would be someone in HR mm -hmm. or organization development or training. And the typical problem would be something along the lines of, um, hey, we acquired a company in country so-and-so, and we need to integrate these guys with us, um, and we're finding it hard to do so, et cetera, et cetera. So that would be one thing. So, um, so do they come to yeah. you when they already have faced the problem because they didn't know that will emerge? Usually you are like the crisis manager there? Yes, most mm -hmm. of the time uh, people approach me when the problems are evident, and when the, when the field is already, you know, crying for help to the professional HR and OD people, right? Um, there, are, there are few organizations along the years who have approached me before things began. And I think it's actually, uh, I think it's actually a, a better way, but I can understand why uh, sometimes it's not prioritized. Yeah, so we are also covering awareness piece here, which saves money and time and conflicts and makes those right. acquisitions more effective. Awesome. Right, right. Um, I think that another um, timing um, where I get a lot of approaches is where suddenly an organization begins to deliver its product to uh, a certain multinational. Right. So, for example, an organization would approach me when they've landed their first contract with a, a North American multinational and they want to say, hey, we're starting to work with these guys. We want to know how to deliver our services or our product to them better. So what I would try to do is to go over the steps um, in the delivery process and to make sure that they are culturally aligned. Yeah, so you said acquisitions is one point of help and support. The other one is uh, going to additional markets, expanding uh, your penetration, actually. Is there anything else from those major items? I guess it's another case of uh, expansion, not only through uh, mergers and acquisitions, but just through just simple expansion, right? They're opening more offices. Uh, they have more people on board from different cultures. 
and they want to make sure that um, uh, their values of diversity and um, their uh, overall engagement uh, is supported. Yeah, that's great. And actually, that leads me to another question. So we discussed through how you help, but can you give me also examples where those pitfalls are? What are those conflicts like maybe drain revenues when people come to you? Just a couple of major examples. Yeah, um, so let's talk about um, a delivery example, okay? Um, let's say that you have um, an organization uh, delivering to an uh, American multinational, delivering its service or its product. And um, the organization comes from a culture which is very agile, very flexible, very, uh, sometimes even chaotic a little bit. Like Israel. Right? <laughs> Maybe. Uh, <laughs> and the and the Israelis maybe who wanna uh, who wanna make a good impression and they wanna succeed they arrive in the customer uh, on the customer site with their equipment and their laptops and they're quickly plugging themselves into the system and what they find out is that they haven't read all of the contract and all of the tiny tiny letters and and uh, phrases in the contract which say that you cannot <laughs> that you cannot connect laptop x to machine y and to them you know it's they want to succeed and they want to make a good impression and they want to deliver quickly and they don't understand why the customer is becoming upset and the customer is saying you didn't read the contract or you're not following our rules right and then maybe uh, an israeli manager out of very good intentions you know uh, might say, you know, okay, fine, I, I understand those are the rules, but what's the logic behind those rules? True. And the American, and the American would say, well, you know what, I, I didn't make them up, but they're the rules, so just go by the rules, right? So, um, so when you have this kind of an incident, um, it creates some uh, suspicion. It creates a little bit of bad faith. And when you have several of those incidents, then it becomes the relationship between the vendor and the customer becomes, becomes strained, you know? So I don't know if I can put a price tag on it. I wouldn't want to do that, but I think everybody understands from a common sense perspective that you want to try to avoid that. Absolutely. That's such a lively example, I would say, because there is also difference between different types of organizations, I would say, smaller organizations versus bigger, larger organizations, which are more restrained to regulatory requirements, maybe. So that's something right. that's important to, right. to understand. You're, you're right. I mean, cultural differences aren't only national culture, right? Mm -hmm. there's, uh, there are cultural differences that are also... Um, uh, industry related, and they're also related to the size of the organization, right? I focus Absolutely. mainly on national culture, but there are a lot of types of cultural differences. You're right. I, I'm thinking of uh, another example that I, uh, that I heard uh, a while ago already. Um, it was a large multinational that wanted to uh, cut its uh, workforce in uh, India. Mm -hmm. And when the HR uh, visited the, the Indian site, she noticed that there were a lot of uh, people there who were, you know, running errands or who were preparing the tea or who were doing something. And she, and she said she asked a question which she thought was valid. She said, you know, well, um, back in the US or back in wherever, we have our, our kitchens, you know, on every floor and every manager can make coffee or tea or whatever for himself or herself. You don't need the people who would do it for you, right? But mm -hmm. then the, the Indian executives in the Indian side, they looked at her and they said, no, what, this is not something that our culture can tolerate, right? Now, regardless of that specific organization, it might have been because the Indian culture is sometimes a little bit more hierarchical and maybe it would feel less comfortable 
for a senior executive to prepare his or her own tea, okay? Maybe in that kind of a culture, you need to consider the fact that there are going to be, that there's going to be more hierarchy, right? So you, you're gonna to need to have to make your cuts elsewhere. Oh, wow. That's an amazing example, which actually, yeah, leads me to the next question. So we mentioned those uh, very collaborative cultures, like uh, I bet Israelis and Brazilians and maybe Italians, and that is the North Americans and then the, the Asian cultures. And I see everybody here in Toronto, which is amazing. And then uh, I think it would be great to, to see what are the main, the hugest differences between those, let's say, three clusters? Is it, again, distancing? Is it hierarchy? Is it the way we communicate? Well, there are, um, there are several dimensions mm -hmm. that um, we can use in order to show the differences and sometimes the similarities between these three types of cultures, okay? But let's just take one, okay? Um, sometimes, uh, well, according to certain theories, uh, you can call the uh, North American culture, you can call it a dignity culture, okay? A dignity culture mm -hmm. means that a person's self sense of self-worth comes from within, from achieving the tasks that you set out to achieve or completing all of the requirements of your own role, okay? Mm -hmm. um, the Mediterranean and the Latin cultures are typically called, they're not called dignity cultures, they're called honor cultures. And honor cultures are those cultures where your self-worth is determined by the fact or by the question whether you were able to maintain your honor in front of other people, okay? So that's why you have people maybe in those cultures, you can stereotypically think of people um, uh, fighting over uh, who's going to be first on the road or who's going to be first in line or something like that, okay? So we had the dignity cultures, which are North American, and we had the honor cultures, which are Latin and Mediterranean. And as for the Asian cultures, we call them face cultures. And face cultures means that your self-worth comes a lot from your group belongingness and the way you perceive the group to respect you, okay? And why is it called face? Because your social face is sort of like a currency, right? You manage your, uh, your impression all the time to make sure that you are appreciated by the group, right? Otherwise, you will lose face, okay? And you always want to save your own face. So that's one of the differences between dignity cultures, honor cultures, and face cultures, which is the difference where your self-worth would come from. Oh, that's complicated and so diverse. <laughs> that's where the diversity comes into play. Do you have that magic bullet or one to three tools that are guaranteeing success if you face those, let's say, three or four or five cultures and you have to help the company to figure it out? Well, um, I don't know if I can wave a magic wand. But I have some things that I, uh, that I try to suggest. Um, one of them is to acquire knowledge, okay? Mm -hmm. Do your research before you do anything, okay? So talk to people who've been there and consult with experts. And actually, this doesn't have to cost a lot of money by paying very expensive consultants. There's actually very good information out there on the internet, which you can sometimes use. There are um, a few databases which can provide you with, a, uh, when you pay a very small fee, they can provide you with your own cultural profile and the profile of those business cultures that interest you. And you get something 
um, uh, again, for a very small fee, you get something which can help you get started, do business in those cultures, okay? So that's one thing. Um, and the other one is uh, if I talk about an attitude, then I think the attitude that I wanna promote most is giving people the benefit of the doubt, okay? So, so many times when somebody does something to us in the global environment, we interpret it according to our culture. Mm -hmm. And then we think, why did he do this to me? Why was he so aggressive to me? Why was he disrespectful or she was disrespectful, right? But when we work in a global environment, I just want to say, give people the benefit of the doubt. Assume that in 90% of the cases, the misunderstanding that occurred was due to a cultural um, reason and not a personal reason. Yeah, sometimes people are going to disrespect you, okay? And sometimes people are going to fight with you. But first of all, give them the benefit of the doubt. Wow, okay? that, that's a big thing. And I have to ask, do different cultures give and ask for feedback differently? Because I think that's a huge, huge thing, being able to ask for feedback, but also being able to receive it. Yes, yes. So um, that brings us to the topic of communication. Um, there are some cultures where communication is pretty direct. And in those cultures, the value underlying communication is that the message needs to be very accurate. Whatever is on my mind, I want to make sure that I communicate it in a way that you will understand precisely, okay? And this is typical of um, North American cultures. Um, it's typical of Germans and of Scandinavians and of the Dutch. But in so many cultures around the world, for example, the Asian cultures, communication isn't direct. Actually, it's rather indirect. And the reason for it, it's hard to understand when you come from Israel or Germany or even the US, you know, like New York or something, right? It's hard to imagine that communication in Asia has a different underlying value, right? Mm -hmm. It's not that the message has to be accurate. It's that communication needs to preserve social harmony. There needs to be <sighs> harmony between people, okay? Now, what happens if I need to give feedback, right? Yeah. You asked me about feedback. What happens yeah. if I need to give feedback, which is not so great? right? Or I need to refuse a request, right? Or I need to say no, okay? I need to find a way to do that, to give that feedback in a way that's going to be very indirect so that social harmony is going to be maintained, mm -hmm. but you will still understand that I give you a not so great feedback. That's a tough one. <laughs> that's a tough one. Seriously. Yeah, um, I can give you I can give you an example of how that works. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, sometimes let's assume we have a Zoom call or a conference call that um, should last an hour. Okay. So if you have it in the U.S. or in Germany or in Israel, then people would have some small talk in the beginning, and then they would dive right into the issues. You know, we have a problem. Let's talk about it so we can fix it. Okay. That's direct communication, right? So around minute number 10 or minute number 15, you're already in the issues, okay? Yeah, solutions already. Oftentimes, yeah. right. Oftentimes in indirect cultures, right? Um, people wait more until they bring up the issue, okay? So they wait and they wait because they are looking for the right timing, or they're not sure how raising the issue is going to be um, uh, received on the other end. So they wait and they don't bring it up yet. Now, if you are, if they're talking to direct communicators yeah. then the direct communicators are thinking, yeah, yeah come on. <laughs> uh, if they're thinking, come on, raise the issue, right? And they get upset or they might not even be aware that there is an issue. So they're thinking, wow, oh, that's this so is true. Going, this is going great. 
nothing is, there's no problem. The other side isn't raising any issues, right? But then mm -hmm. in minute number 46 of the meeting, someone is uh, on the Asian side or on the South American side or on the African or Middle Eastern side, Middle Eastern, which is not Israel. Um, somebody in minute number 46 says, you know, but there is something that we wanted to discuss. And that's when the direct communicators go really crazy. They're like, what were you waiting for <laughs> until now, right? What were you waiting for? And for the indirect communicators, it's hard to understand the question because they really need more time in order to raise this issue, right? So it's a big deal. Oh, it sounds like you need a master degree <laughs> in order to be a good leader, a good dots connector, <laughs> a good team lead, and actually make things happen. That's more sophisticated um, than I could have imagined. <laughs> it's, um, um, I think it's complicated, but I don't think that um, you need to have all of the knowledge or you need to be constantly aware. I think that again, if you apply simple rules, like giving people the benefit of the doubt and mm -hmm. understanding that behaviors are relative, right? The way I behave isn't the absolute truth, but it's the way people behave in my region. And I wanna be open to the possibility that people in other places behave in a different way. I wanna be completely open to it and to try to, you know, to try to understand it and be curious about it and appreciate Julius, yeah. the growth opportunity, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, that's amazing. Sometimes I do feel my husband comes from a different planet. That's probably <laughs> difference between male and female brain. So I want to ask you about um, marketing aspect of the things. Do you often happen to help marketeers? especially probably when they need to market to a different region, because from my experience, we were in Israel selling into North America, into Europe, while not really having done business there. Well, I have to say that once in a while, when I have a marketing group, uh, I think it, it really opens up my mind because mm -hmm. um, when you talk to people who do marketing, then um, you know, they, um, it seems to me that they need to get into the psychology of people, <laughs> right? They need to understand how people work and how to persuade them. And they need to understand so many issues, right? Like the language, and they need to have like all sorts of data, like what type of channels should I use in order to, you know, reach people, et cetera. So um, I find that when I have a, a group of marketeers that I work with, then typically the conversations are very, very rich. And I must say that I'm not a marketing person myself. So many times I don't have the answers to, you know, what's the uh, penetration of social networks in a certain region or which social network is the, the most useful one to market you know, product X or product Y. But I think that there are some principles that uh, marketers uh, need to remember when they do marketing out of their own culture, right? And mm -hmm. there's this great example, um, uh, which is backed up by research about um, uh, things that are masculine in one language but feminine in another language. So let's take, for example. Yeah, yes. me so with take, three languages. I'm thinking of that. Yeah, you're right. Yes, yes. So let's take a let's take a, a simple example. Let's say you want to market silverware. Okay, you want to market a fork, mm -hmm. and you're doing a funny commercial with an animated fork, and you need to think of whether to choose a female voice for the fork or a male voice for the fork, right? So if you are coming from your own culture and you already developed this great concept, et cetera, and you weren't considering what's happening in other places, you might be making a mistake because you'll discover that maybe in your language, fork is masculine and in somebody else's language, fork is feminine. 
So maybe the, the way you chose to portray the fork in the animation won't work, but there's even more to that, wow. okay? Um, there are uh, this really, really interesting research that has found that people in different cultures speaking different languages describe um, certain nouns according to whether they are masculine or feminine. So for example, if you show people um, in Germany and people in Spain, a picture of a bridge, bridge, and you ask them to describe the bridge, the speakers of Spanish, where bridge is masculine, they tend to describe the bridge in masculine terms. They would say it's strong and it's solid and you know these masculine descriptions. And in German, you say the bridge is feminine, uh, die Brücke, it's uh, uh, German for the bridge. And when German speakers describe the same bridge, they describe it as beautiful, and as elegant and as slender and uh, descriptions that are more feminine, right? And I think that if you don't have that kind of knowledge beforehand, you might be making, you might be developing a concept that in the end might not work where you want to market your stuff. Construction companies, be aware. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. I was working with a uh, um, I was working with a company that makes bridges, among other things, a while ago. And this is exactly the, uh, the example that we were discussing. And did they end up doing different designs of bridges for Germany and Spain? I don't think so. I don't think so, because they weren't the ones, the bridges didn't need marketing. But it was an interesting it was an interesting experience because there were people from all over the place, and it was interesting to see how they perceived the bridge differently. You know, oh, that's just amazing. Uh, briefly, can you describe your typical process when you work with a company? Yes, I um, uh, I do a needs assessment um, where I try to discover the pain points of people. I try to see what keeps senior executives up at night with regards to global issues and cultural differences. And I try to talk to people and see where they have the most pain. Is it written communication? Mm -hmm. Is it um, face to face? Well, we haven't had face to face in quite a while, right? Yeah. But uh, maybe we'll have that again. Um, and then I try to structure my uh, workshop or my process around what I heard. So I would choose the specific exercises that I think would add the most value. And I would consider um, adding um, case studies if it's relevant. For one of the organizations that I worked with, I decided to use the opportunity when an Indian executive was over in that country for a visit. Mm -hmm. And I asked him to join the workshop on India for the last hour. So what we did was mm -hmm. for three hours, we talked about the Indian culture. And then in the last hour, we had an Indian executive and the participants could ask him all of the questions that they developed during the previous oh, three yeah. hours. The validation time. stage. Yes. The yes, ROI. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And it was, uh, there are some memorable moments from that conversation, which are going to go with me for a very, very long time. Give me just one. Well, the, the participants who were all Israeli and therefore coming from an organization which isn't very hierarchical, um, they heard from me during the first three hours of the workshop. They, we talked about the fact that Indians are more hierarchical and therefore um, managers would expect to decide more, et cetera. But they couldn't imagine how much this specific mm -hmm. manager was eager to decide on until they actually had a talk with him. And they kept running these questions by him. They said, uh, so uh, listen, if uh, I just want to ask your subordinate a quick question about so-and-so, is it okay that I contact him directly without uh, copying you? And the Indian manager said to them, 
no, I asked, no? You, to contact, I asked you to copy me, please. Oh and they were shocked. And then someone said, okay, wait, but if we're talking budget wise, then for things that are lower than a certain sum, is it okay that I contact your people directly? I mean, it's a small sum. You probably don't need to approve it, right? And he said, no, I ask you to contact me about this as well. And it was a, such a shock to Israeli participants that theory actually came to life. You know, they really understood from that Indian executive's own mouth that hierarchy in India, it's not a question of theory. This is the way it's gonna work, right? So it was a very enlightening conversation. Indeed. Give me your, the proudest moment of your career, please. It's not like a spotlight moment where there was something huge that happened, but uh, I think that I have small moments of pride when I am in a, you know, I'm in the lobby of a certain organization waiting for my meeting to begin. Again, in those long gone days when we actually had face-to-face -face yeah. meetings, right? So I'm sitting in the lobby and I'm sipping my coffee and then somebody walks by and um, he might walk over and say to me, um, wow, you're, you're uh, Elon, right? And I say, yeah. It's, and he might, this happened to me a while ago. He said, wow, you know, I've been in your session um, 10 years ago and I still remember so-and-so. Yeah. And to me, that I think that, you know, it's a small moment, but to me, that's like a moment of pride that something was able to stick after so many years, I like that. Yeah, that I basically like that. means, yeah, people are becoming more, more, uh, more open to a different culture or to a different opinion that, that actually brings us to better collaboration and better consensus. Yeah, 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 yeah. Now it doesn't happen always and I'm pretty sure I'm not successful with all the people that I coach and all the people in my workshops the same way. But yeah, sometimes that happens and I think it, it makes me proud. Proud pride is a good is a good description here. Absolutely and happy. Uh, what did um, Zoom environment change in your work and maybe in your clients' work, how they approach your services? It's surprising that um, it didn't change that much. Wow. I mm -hmm. Was, yeah, when we started um, working over Zoom and Teams and all those other technologies, there was a period where I thought that cultural differences would be much less significant because everybody's undergoing mm -hmm. this big change mm -hmm. and everyone's working from home and everybody's suffering from Zoom, yeah. etc. Same pain points, yeah. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah. But, but what happened? is that for some cultural differences, it actually magnified their importance. I'll give you an example. Um, Please do. Mm -hmm. Yes, in some cultures, uh, uh, some cultures are uh, more expressive when it comes to the face. And some cultures are less expressive. You know, you have people sitting like this. Like their picture, yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. And, and you know, sometimes you think that the Zoom froze right? Yeah. Because it's the same faith. They're not moving any muscle, right? Now, um, it may be an individual thing, but it also may be a cultural thing. Cultures are different with regards to the expressiveness of communication, including the face. Now, what happens over Zoom or over any other technology is that you really focus on the face, right? Yeah. So if you're used to seeing an expressive face, you're looking for it all the time, right? And if you're not, if you're used to seeing a face that's much less expressive, then you get, you may get really distressed when somebody speaks like I do, you know, with moving all over the place and with a lot of expressions, etc. So some of the cultural differences were actually magnified. Oh wow! Or is it like, are you listening to me at all? <laughs> if if people are not yeah. moving, right? <laughs> yeah. Does it make sense what I'm saying? Yeah, it happens. It happens. <laughs> right, that happens too. That's just amazing. Um, I wanted to ask you, you talked about different people, executives or just professionals. Do you have one piece of advice, and we mentioned make your research already, which 
each one of us can actually adapt. Maybe it's about how to identify if there is cultural difference in play, because I miss that a lot. When I try to think if something is personal or, or cultural, I try to think in a meeting, you know, when in a Zoom meeting um, or in a face-to-face -face meeting, I try to see whether I saw that behavior only once with a certain individual or whether I see it in two or more individuals. I think that's my wow. first rule of mm -hmm. thumb when I start thinking, wow, this is a cultural differences. So for example, um, I, um, maybe it's individual or maybe it's because I'm Israeli. I really like talkative groups. I really like when I'm working in a session and people interrupt me and people say to me, you're wrong, you don't understand anything. <laughs> yeah. I really like that kind of communication, right? And what happens when I work with groups from Japan or from Sweden or from Finland, then um, there's a lot of silence, right? So um, I've already learned to see um, if only one person is silent, then I guess it's teaching me something about that person individually. But the minute I start seeing two or more people silent, I'm saying to myself, wow, I might be seeing something cultural here and mm -hmm. not necessarily individual. And those are the things that interest me really. Yeah, and for a good reason. Yeah. Yeah, you know, another example is another example is um, when the session starts, right? So mm -hmm. when my first session in Germany started precisely on time, I said to myself, well, you know what, there's a stereotype about Germans being accurate and precise. Okay. But when my 10th session in Germany started precisely on time, I said, <laughs> wow, this is really part of their culture, you know? That's amazing. Absolutely. Well, my mom is a good example to that. And I am a total Israeli. Mm. So I remember all those cases when the international team, the European team was coming over to Israel and we were trying to start the meetings on time. So that played out, <laughs> but that was due to your lecture and your education, I guess, when we were aware mm -hmm. there might be cultural differences in play. Elon, I enjoyed the conversation really, really, really well. And maybe you can, yeah, maybe you can um, give me just one main major thought that you want our listeners to remember from this conversation. I want, I'd like us all, I think, to be less judgmental about our own culture and about the cultures of our colleagues, okay? Because um, I think sometimes it's, uh, it's very easy to uh, either be judgmental about our colleagues because they're from a certain culture or to take our own culture and to be judgmental about ourselves. Yeah. I really want, when we speak about cultures, I really want to take judgment out of the picture. You know, I want us to think that we can learn from each other, that we can create synergies um, by working together and bringing all of these different competencies and all of these different tendencies together, right? So cultural differences, I'd like us to view them as a, an opportunity instead of a threat, which sometimes we do. You are so right, and I agree with you, because we take judgment out of the picture, then we create a safer environment where each individual can contribute from his or her knowledge and experience and actually culture. And then we can create mm -hmm. more solutions and pivot between them and everybody will mm -hmm. be involved. That sounds like mm -hmm. a very futuristic, but actually if we implement your tools, we can yes. get there faster. Amazing. I hope so. I hope so. Thank you so much, Alan. Thank you, Kira.